So just a little bit about what we're talking about um, today. Uh, we're going to be talking about what the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary study is. That's the study that the Army Corps of Engineers is leading and why that is important. We'll talk about the role that the Army Corps of Engineers plays. We'll talk about the Waterfront Alliance and our, um, our rise to this challenge and the partners that we've engaged with and what we've been doing since the release of the study. Uh, we'll also be talking about the timeline for some of the infrastructure that's being proposed and also opportunities to get involved. And I'll be talking at the end and Tyler as well, that this is a very, very long project. We're talking about a five, 10, 15, potentially 20 year engagement. And so there'll be a strategy that we'll be releasing later in about three or four months about what that long timeline looks like for Army Corps of Engineers engagement. And then we'll have a uh, q and in the last part of this, uh, of today's webinar, where we invite you to ask questions. And so I want to introduce our speakers. We are so excited to have uh, Colonel John Goulet, the former commander of the New York District of the Army Corps of Engineers, and currently Senior Vice President at Dewberry Engineers, who also happens to be a Waterfront Alliance board member. So thank you, John, so much for joining. We'll also be hearing after John from Tyler Taba, who's our Senior Manager for Climate Policy at the Waterfront Alliance, and then we'll be followed by a Q&A after that. So I'm going to turn it over next slide to, to John, and John, come and thank you so much for setting the context and giving us more background. Well, thanks, Courtney. It's great to be here and uh, proud to be uh, a board member on the Waterfront Alliance, um, the strongest uh, resilience uh, advocate in the region. Um, proud, like I said, with our association. Let me tell you a little bit about the core. Um, you know, it's an interesting agency. It's got a long history. Um, and people say, well, what does the core do? And, you know, they really the answer to that question is whatever Congress asks the core to do and they put into law. Um, but essentially, there's four main missions for the core. Uh, three have to do with um, water resources development across the nation. Uh, and the fourth one really has to do with the designing and building all the Army and Air Force uh, facilities across uh, the country and across uh, the globe. Um, but the three having to do with water resources have to do with um, navigation. Um, those of you that um, are paying attention in this region know that um, we did a harbor deepening to allow the largest um, um, container ships in the world in and out of New York, New Jersey Harbor. Well, um, that deepening was led by the Corps, and that's part of its navigation mission to ensure that commerce uh, can move across uh, the globe um, as necessary, and especially in, in waters of the United States. The Corps is also uh, very much into uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration. Uh, from the Industrial Revolution forward, lots of ecosystems were impacted by human activities uh, in, in, in our estuaries and our rivers, um, lakes, and uh, the core is directed by Congress to restore uh, those estuaries. Some recent activity would be rebuilding marsh wetlands, salt marsh wetlands in Jamaica Bay, for instance, over the last 10 years. The Corps has uh, done a lot of that work. Um, and then the last one, the one we're talking about today, really is the mission for coastal and riverine flood risk management um, across this country that really was born out of legislation that was passed early in the 20th century when uh, the Mississippi River in particular um, and the communities along it faced some massive flooding. A Congress um, asked the Corps to get involved. Uh, in, in trying to solve those problems and, and their authority extended uh, to the coastal uh, regions um, uh, beyond that. And um, that's why the Corps is the primary federal agency involved in, in the, the HATS uh, development. You know, it's important to understand, you know, people wonder why the Army of all, uh, of all agencies is involved in water resources development. It's an interesting story you know, part of the history of the United States in that, you know, you say the United States Army Corps of Engineers um, really was born um, 
out of our military academy at West Point when uh, we had to develop this nation, this vast nation that hadn't been surveyed, hadn't really been settled. Um, and um, Congress looked across the, the, the government and said, the only real engineering we have indigenous to the United States is in the army. And, and, and the education of engineers was done for the first 50 years. The only real formal college level education we had was at, at the military academy at West Point. So Congress asked the army to get involved in, in really developing you know, our waterways as commerce routes, et cetera. And, and that really in the early 19th century. And, and, and that, that sort of mission has stuck with the Army since then because the Army Corps and the engineers have been successful in, in delivering it. Um, you know, just going back to military facilities, it's interesting to note that, um, you know, the battery um, at, um, at Southern uh, Manhattan and, and on Governor's Island, these, these were early military facilities that the Corps built and um, actually uh, proved very effective at keeping, for instance, the British out of New York in the War of 1812. Um, so, uh, you know, my point here is that um, the Corps has had a lot of connection with this great city and this great region since the very beginning of our nation. As a matter of fact, an interesting story in development of waterways is in 1885, one of the largest non-nuclear explosions occurred on the East River, and it was planned. Um, it was about 300,000 pounds of explosive to remove rocks um, near Hell, Hell Gate on the East River near Randall's Island because um, wooden ships were running aground, wooden ships carrying supplies from uh, uh, from Europe were running aground. And uh, so the Corps was asked to essentially deepen the East River at the time. Some great pictures of people standing on their roofs in, uh, in Brooklyn, which looked a lot different than it does today, um, um, staring at these, uh, this explosion that goes off that, that left water 250, 300 feet in the air when it, when it was. Look it up on the internet. It's a very interesting story. But again, another New York story. So. Let's go to the next slide and talk about um, um, hats here a little bit. And, and again, this comes from the Army's um, uh, responsibility to manage uh, flooding on the coast. And the, Corps, the Congress asked uh, through the appropriation that's highlighted um, the Corps to undergo this large study of the North Atlantic after Sandy to identify um, vulnerable areas uh, to recommend um, further uh, studies and, um, and identify threats and risks, et cetera, through the, for the entire North Atlantic. And uh, they did that, Congre uh, the Corps did that, and they identified three areas in particular that were at risk, one of them being the uh, New York, New Jersey region. And, and so from that larger study, that North Atlantic, uh, study that's underlined on this slide, the HAT study was born. And it was born and it was given to the New York district. And I think if we go to the next slide, we'll see uh, we'll see the area in green, uh, you know, over 2,000 square miles uh, in green and, and, um, and, and other areas that encompass what's called the study area, which you know, will eventually, if this study is approved, become the project area, uh, which means um, things will be designed and built uh, within that area. It's a massive area requiring lots of, um, of, 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 of study and uh, lots of, you know, 25 counties, two states, the largest city in the United States, 16 million people impacted. And people don't realize, what, you know, the study area is all the way up to Albany. And it's out to, you know, across the New York bite and beyond. So massive study. And um, what they did was they they looked at options. And we're going to talk, and Tyler's going to follow me here with um, options. But the core really and the federal government, and it's important to, to know, is really the, the, the only single source where a truly regional approach to 
flood protection, coastal flood risk reduction. I hate to use, I shouldn't use the word protection because there's always risk. Um, this risk reduction, it's, the federal government is really the only agency that can, you know, the only entity that, that can handle this and be able to afford it and, 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 and build it. I mean, if you want, if you truly want a regional plan, there's really one source to go to, and that's our federal government. If you want a local plan, there's, there can be multiple uh, places to go to get that done. But if you're looking for a regional plan, it's our federal government and that agency that's, um, that by law are required to um, act on these uh, challenges is, is, the, is the Army Corps of Engineers. So let's go to the, the next slide and talk about timeline a little bit, and then I'll turn it over. Um, let me just start. There's a lot of uh, core mumbo jumbo. Sometimes I think the agency exists in a different, uh, you know, they speak a whole different language than, uh, than I do. Well, I, I, you know, I used to speak core, but then, then I retired. But uh, anyway, um, the important takeaway on this slide really is um, where we are, and you can see the star there, we're somewhere in the process between two and three, but where we're headed in this report, if it's to continue, is, is something called a chief's report. And you can see that there listed as number five. And the chief is the chief of engineers, it's a three-star army general. He signs off on this report and he submits it to Congress. And then Congress votes and approves that chief's report in what's called the Water Resource Development Act, or uh, colloquial, it's called WERDA, um, because you know it's it's the federal government, and it's the military, and everything has to have an acronym. Um, and uh, so, where this is headed is potentially a WERDA authorization, um, and that would happen maybe around 2030, at the earliest. Um, so we've got some time, as, as Courtney said, to influence this, and I know we're doing that now. Um, but then after it's authorized, um, you're allowed to spend exactly zero federal dollars on it, because um, in order to get federal uh, funding to construct, it, it, has, it has to be done through the appropriations process, and that would follow uh, the word. You can't appropriate funds against a project until it's an authorized project. Um, federally authorized. So funding to actually do the engineering and construction of this would happen after that. Um, so you're looking at, uh, you know, six or seven years down the road before you have to worry about significant engineering design or any construction being done on hats. And I guess the last point I'll make is this is a $52 billion of project right now. Is there another slide or is the next one yours, Tyler? Let's let's see. There, there's a next slide that covers the the timeline and and uh and costs and the TSP. But go ahead and talk if you want oh. to speak to the uh, cost and and construction. Go go for it. Beautiful, beautiful. So I just want to let people know, um, and, and then I'll turn it over to Tyler as a segue. Is it's fifty two billion dollar project all in. Um, in order to um move this forward, um, the states of New York and New Jersey and the city of New York need to sign up for their share of that cost. Their share is about $18 billion right now. They get some credits um, against that. And then they would likely have to sign up to do the operations and maintenance of this project, which is estimated to be at over $300 million a year in order to maintain it after it's, after it's built. So, you know, these are major challenges ahead of, um, in terms of economics and something to keep in mind. And with that, to describe the tentatively selected plan and what that's all about, I'll turn it back over to Tyler. Thank you, sir. Awesome, thank you so much, Sean. You can stay on that last slide there, uh, David, thanks. Uh, so thanks for that really great overview of who the Army Corps of Engineers are, the impetus behind HATS and the goal of the study and timeline and sort of where we're at in the process right now. Um, Again, my name is Tyler. I'm the Senior Manager for Climate Policy at Waterfront Alliance. Really great to have everybody here to discuss this study and project and what the future of our uh, waterfront and shorelines might look like. So just jumping right in, um, as John covered in that last slide, you saw number three on the timeline was what's known as the tentatively selected plan. 
So what you're seeing here on the right side of the screen um, is alternative 3B, which is the alternative that was selected by the core as the tentatively selected plan. So this process, through this process, the core evaluates a series of alternatives. In this case, there were five, uh, which span from alternative one being no action. Um, alternative two was a massive storm surge barrier from Sandy Hook, New Jersey, all the way to Breezy Point uh, in, on the Rockaways. And alternative five being a fully shore-based approach that has no barriers. And 3B on this slide is right in the middle of that mega barrier and a shore-based only approach. This alternative uh, includes a combination of what's known as in-water structures. So those are the storm surge barriers um, and shore-based measure measures like berms and flood walls. And you'll, you'll see a series of these storm surge barriers proposed in black on this map, for example, along Jamaica Bay, um, the Arthur Kill, uh, the Guanas Canal, Throgs Neck, as well as some shore-based measures in purple and red. And I'll get into the specifics of what these might look like in reality in just a moment, but this map gives you a little bit of a high level understanding of where the core has identified the greatest need for infrastructure based on that study that John was talking about. So just before I jump into the uh, specifics and some renderings, I just wanna reemphasize John's point again on funding and construction. Um, the, the cost that you see here is an estimation based on the core's study. None of that funding has actually been authorized or appropriated yet, so there's zero dollars um, available to build any of this infrastructure. The funding that's been secured so far has only been for the study. Uh, so the, but, and, and the likelihood of all this funding being allocated in one go around is pretty unlikely. Um, so if it's going to be built, it's probably gonna be built in waves. Uh, and that sort of begs the question about what actually gets built, how do certain projects get prioritized over others? And we'll get into all these questions in a moment, but I just think that's an important sort of uh, frame and lens for this conversation. So onto the next slide, I wanna go through some of the renderings uh, and concepts that the Army Corps has developed. And let me just say that these are simply renderings. It's not to say that this is exactly what the Corps has in mind, but it's a good way to visualize at least how they're thinking about some of these, uh, some of these projects. And so this slide is focused on a few of the shore-based measures that the Corps is proposing. At the far left, you'll see a seawall along Huron Street in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Um, in the middle, uh, a seawall along Christopher Street in Manhattan, and on the far right, a wall, um, an ele elevated promenade along Exchange Place in Jersey City. Um, your first reaction is probably the same as mine. These are kind of ugly, um, but you know the 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 way that we're approaching this is that these renderings are really failing to show any green infrastructure or nature-based solutions and and really lack creativity and innovation all around the world. And even here in New York and New Jersey, in some places, we're seeing a shift in thinking about coastal infrastructure towards uh, incorporating resilience, ecology, and public access as a way to protect against storms uh, and sea level rise and extreme rainfall. And I think these sort of concepts fall a little short of that mark. And so we have to ask ourselves, is a walled off waterfront the future that we wanna see? In the next slide, um, we'll look at some of the in-water structures that I mentioned. So these are the storm surge barriers. Um, on the left is the Arthur Kill barrier, which is connecting uh, southeastern Staten Island to Perth Amboy in New Jersey. And on the right is a barrier along Jamaica Bay. These barriers are intended to open and close in advance of a major storm. The specifics of how and when the barriers would open and close is still not fully determined, but the idea is that they would close when a flood warning is, is issued. So on the next slide, um, I just wanna jump into, and just shift gears a little bit into Waterfront Alliance's work and approach for this whole process. So for those who might not be aware on this call, Waterfront Alliance spearheads the Rise to Resilience Coalition, which is a coalition of more than a hundred organizations across New York and New Jersey. And what makes Rise to Resilience so unique is the coalition's representation among such a diverse suite of organizations and missions. Um, we're not just environmental organizations, but also residents, um, leaders in labor, environmental justice, housing, design, um, volunteer groups, emergency preparedness, academia, and so many more. I mean, we all sort of collectively come together to urge that climate resilience be an urgent policy priority. Our floodplain is diverse. There's a lot of different uses all across the floodplain um, and along the waterfront from residential, commercial, industrial, recreation, maritime, um, and that diverse floodplain requires a set of diverse stakeholders to really champion collective action. And that's sort of what we do here at Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition. So on the next slide, um, 
together with the coalition, we have been active, engaged, and really at the forefront of advocacy on the Army Corps and HATS since the, since the inception of the, of the study. More than five years ago, uh, Waterfront Alliance submitted a letter to the Army Corps' New York District Office recommending that equity be at the center of the Corps' alternative selection, recommending an increase in community engagement and empowerment throughout the process, um, a thorough evaluation of nature-based and non-structural solutions, and the inclusion of sea level rise. I'll get into some of these recommendations in just a moment. Um, so I don't want to get too into the weeds on the process, but this is actually the second go around for the core and a tentatively selected plan. Some of you may remember this if you've been tracking the study, um, but in 2018, the core selected uh, alternative two as their tentatively selected plan, which was that six mile long barrier from Sandy Hook, New Jersey, all the way to Breezy Point on Rockaway that I mentioned earlier. And there was a lot of fierce opposition against this proposal, including from Waterfront Alliance and members of the coalition, because it was very focused on just storm surge and had very little to no regard for sea level rise. And we know that climate risks don't operate in silos. Um, sea level and rise and storm surge are connected and they actually compound each other. So any major resilient infrastructure project should consider this full suite of coastal risks that we face. Otherwise it's really failing to protect us um, against uh, the, the risks in the future. So in 2019, uh, the funding for HATS was actually halted by the previous administration. And while we were upset that the funding was pulled altogether, this was really an opportunity, the coalition and Waterfront Alliance saw this as an opportunity to really spring into action um, and try to shift the study to focus on those recommendations that I just mentioned. So in 2020, we submitted a letter to federal, state, and local elected officials calling for the project to be reauthorized and refined um, to evaluate some of those recommendations. And later that year, um, our recommendations were adopted into the Water Resources Development Act, or WERDA, that John was talking about earlier. Um, and that was supported by the United States Senate and House. And this was a, a major victory because it really sent the Corps back to the drawing board to look into the study from a much more holistic perspective. And when that Water Resources Development Act was passed and signed by the president, the, that was in 2020, the New York and New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study was officially reauthorized and the core could begin working again, uh, but this time with a stronger focus on equity, nature, and comprehensive flood risk. So this photo you see here on the right side of the slide is a letter from May 2021, uh, where we were able to obtain support to reaffirm our recommendations um, in a letter from some of the key elected officials in our region, including Senators Gillibrand, uh, Chuck Schumer, and Representatives Bowman, Ocasio-Cortez, Hakeem Jeffries, Mondar Jones, Jared Nadler, Nidia Velasquez, and many others. Uh, and so as you can imagine, this was a huge victory because we had nearly every member of Congress in our region sign on and support our recommendations for the study. So that's when the core sort of went back and they released alternative 3B, which is what we saw in the previous slide. And while it's still by no means perfect, uh, the needle has definitely shifted in the right direction as a direct result of our advocacy. So uh, just finishing up these last couple bullets on the slide, we're about a week away now from the first public comment deadline and Waterfront Alliance and the Rise Resilience Coalition have developed public comments uh, with specific recommendations for the core on this tentatively selected plan. And um, on, that, on the slide before about the coalition, you, you saw a bullet point that we're a convener uh, and that's really on full display here as we right now have over 40 signatures on our coalition comment letter. And, uh, as you can imagine, these massive infrastructure projects are uh, highly controversial and sometimes not easy to find alignment, but getting 40 groups to sign on and support uh, really speaks to the level of collaboration and agreement that does exist even when it might not look that way. So uh, this is really important because the core evaluates these public comments by taking every recommendation and grouping them into different categories. And those recommendations with the greatest support are usually weighed the greatest by the core. So this strength in numbers approach from the coalition is, is really impactful. And then just that last bullet, Courtney mentioned this at the beginning, uh, Waterfront Alliance, we're in the process of developing a long-term advocacy strategy for HATS, meaning again, five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. What are the different pinch points for advocacy? How can we uh, influence the project outside of public comment periods? What are the different scenarios that we might encounter and how can we prepare for them? And these are really challenging questions, but they're really important if we wanna be sure we have any real chance of securing funding for the project and also ensuring that it's a project worth securing funding for. So moving to the next slide, um, what are our perspectives on HATS? How are we shaping up our comments? So as I mentioned, uh, both Waterfront Alliance and the Rise to Resilience Coalition will be submitting comments 
Um, the first three bullets here are the public comments that the coalition will be submitting, and all six of the bullet points are captured in Waterfront Alliance's comments. These priorities really reflect the input of multiple community and environmental organizations with on the ground experience in highly vulnerable communities um, and technical expertise in resilience. The comments were written with community organizations across both states and are aligned with what several of our partners are putting forward in their own separate comment letters. So for this webinar, I just want to focus on the first three bullets, uh, but more than happy to speak to the latter uh, during the Q&A portion. So let's just go ahead and, and dive right in. Uh, we start by recommending that the core centers environmental justice and disadvantaged communities in this plan. And this is a top line recommendation and so important to capture in a project like HATS. M many of you probably already know this, but there is a disproportionate flood risk gap where a greater number of residents who are experiencing flood risks are low income and communities of color. And this is unfortunately a result of historic disinvestment in a lot of communities through an ugly but very real legacy of redlining that still lives on today. Um, low income and public housing being placed along the floodplain and residents of those communities being less equipped to respond to major climate disasters than their more affluent neighbors. So massive projects like HATS really have the potential to exacerbate some of these inequitable outcomes if environmental justice considerations aren't addressed from the very beginning. The model to date has really been to bring communities into comment on what's already been done and a more equitable route as it relates to centering disadvantaged communities would be to bring those communities in from the very beginning so that their lived experiences and expertise can be part of the design and implementation stages. A lot of environmental justice communities have not been part of the CORE's engagement process and several of them are left out of the plan entirely. So that includes neighborhoods like Hunts Point, South Williamsburg and Sunset Park, for example. Uh, so that's that's sort of the key key recommendation there. But another piece of this is uh, we're recommending that the core develop a more iterative timeline and approach. Um, so rather than one open public comment period before the chief's report, we're calling for a timeline where there would be a refined EIS ahead of the agency decision milestone. So this would allow for the core to host additional public meetings on the revisions that they make based on the community feedback that they get during this public comment period that we're in right now. And then just the last component on the environmental justice recommendation is that we're advising the core to develop a, a public engagement and community empowerment strategy to create an ongoing dialogue between communities and uh, between the communities that are affected by HATS and the core. So one of the steps to achieving this result is forming an environmental and climate justice working group. Several organizations, including Waterfront Alliance, submitted a letter to the New York District Office last year calling for the formation of this group. Um, and the core agreed to move forward, but we still don't have very much indication of how it's going to take shape. Um, but that that would just allow for there to be a, a, a constant communication between the core and communities throughout this long ongoing process, not just at specific times every couple of years. So moving into the second bullet point here, um, which is focused on prioritizing natural and nature-based features and non-structural solutions. We believe that because of the sustained focus on storm surge, the tentatively selected plan relies a little too heavily on those in-water uh, barriers that, that you saw in, in the Jamaica Bay and Arthur Kill renderings and doesn't adequately study or model natural and nature-based features. So that, for example, that includes um, berms and dunes, increased elevation of waterfront, um, green infrastructure to protect neighborhoods and mitigate inland and coastal flooding. So we're recommending that the core employ um, and study the use of natural and nature-based features to reduce the wave damage from smaller and more frequent storms. It's not really clear how or if this project will address the sort of everyday flooding concerns that we're seeing in places like the Rockaways and Canarsie and the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, preparing for another Sandy is obviously really important, but we should also be considering this nuisance flooding that communities are experiencing every day in their neighborhoods. So where structural solutions do move forward, uh, we are recommending that the core use natural and nature-based features like naturalized slope or plantings embedded within those structural solutions um, uh, as, and permeable pavement and all these sorts of things. So really combining that green and gray where you can. And then related to this is that is calling for a phased approach that enables a short term and long term implementation of some projects. So this phased approach would allow for some of some of the near term uh, measures where there's high confidence and support to move forward quickly. 
as as John mentioned, you know, some of this some of this is is set to begin in 2030 if funding is approved, and then there's a 14 year construction timeline estimation for when everything will be built. So this this recommendation allows for the core to move forward quickly with protecting critical infrastructure and environmental justice communities, and really using the public comment period and social vulnerability and environmental justice analysis to kind of inform that prioritization. And then the last bucket under the natural and nature based solutions is that the core should detail um, how they're going to use non-structural solutions like buyouts um, as a legitimate source for a coastal storm or for a coastal risk reduction. So the final category that uh, that I'll cover for for, uh, for for our thoughts on hats is to consider multiple flood risks. And again, we think that the tentatively selected plan might differ if the objectives are expanded to manage multiple flood risks across the across the region. So the main recommendation here is really that the core use local climate projections uh, like the New York City Panel on Climate Change, uh, their sea level rise projections, which show about a one foot difference between sea level rise projections compared with the Army Corps model. So I think the NPCC shows six feet of sea level rise by 2100 and the Corps shows, uh, model shows five feet of sea level rise. And then again, I won't get into the specifics of the last three just for the sake of time, but happy to, uh, they're generally in line with the other recommendations and happy to get more into the specifics if folks are interested during the Q&A. Go to the next slide. Okay, so final slide here. And I just wanted to close out with some of the next steps and what you can expect from us moving forward. So again, first we'll be releasing a long-term advocacy strategy with some different scenarios and how we can be effective throughout this long timeline that exists for a major project like this. Um, we're also going to continue to leverage the power of the Rise to Resilience Coalition, our various expertise, and this idea of strength in numbers. Um, maybe most importantly, uh, this, the, 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 some, something that I think folks should come away with today is understanding that HATS is really, really complex, and there's a lot still up in the air, and we can't put all of our eggs into this basket. There are shortcomings of the study that will hopefully be addressed through our comments, um, but we also need to be prepared for a scenario where they are not. And through the passage of the Infrastructure Jobs and Investment Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, we're looking down the barrel at the largest pocket of federal funding for climate resilience and adaptation ever. Uh, and some of this funding is available right now. So we can't afford, we literally can't afford to rely on HATS as the primary solution for climate resilience. And Waterfront Alliance will be dedicating a lot more thought into how we can leverage some of this funding to move forward with other projects and really having this kind of broad, uh, comprehensive approach to climate resiliency. And then lastly, um, just that we're expanding our work to focus more on some of the immediate needs of communities facing the greatest climate risks and environmental justice conditions. Uh, in the absence of major infrastructure, there's a real need to meet communities where they are and better understand what are the short term priorities so that, again, we're not waiting for this silver bullet solution that's going to protect us all. We should be looking at small and large and green and gray, um, exploring all these sorts of options under the umbrella of climate resilience and, and recognizing that some of this infrastructure could take decades to actually be built. So what do we do in the meantime? So just to conclude, um, I'll, I'll just say that our region faces major, major climate risks from storm surges, not only projected to become uh, more frequent, but also more intense. Uh, sea level rise, where some parts of the Northeast are expected to see a rate more than three times greater than the global average. Extreme precipitation, our region has seen a greater recent increase in extreme precipitation than any other region in the country. We also have some of the oldest industry and building inventory in the United States, much of which was built along the coast and in estuaries highly vulnerable to flooding. But all that to say, we're at a really pivotal moment. And at Waterfront Alliance, we strongly believe that adapting to this new reality of climate risks offers a really unique opportunity to create healthy and resilient and accessible and equitable waterways that are alive with commerce and recreation and exciting waterfront destinations that reflect the liveliness and the diversity of those communities that surround them. Um, these major infrastructure projects can really shape our coastlines for generations. and Climate change, again, poses a whole new challenge to our infrastructure, but that means that we can be thinking about solutions in a whole new way too. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Courtney to lead us into the Q&A. And again, thanks everybody for joining. And um, yeah, I'll close there. All right, thank you, Tyler. And thank you, John. That was really awesome to hear and a great summary. So we can stop sharing the slides. And um, I wanna just uh, make sure to open up, we have about 20 minutes or so. And um, 
I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, sorry, I'm opening the chat here. So the first, I'll, um, I'll answer, we'll answer the first two questions in the chat and then we'll just open it up and anybody can ask questions. So David is asking, um, how have low income communities in Coney Island and the Rockaways been engaged? So Tyler, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as I mentioned, I think a lot of this work and how we engage with communities comes through our work together in a coalition. So the several organizations across Coney Island and the Rockaways, um, including Coney Island Beautification Project, Regional Ready Rockaway, Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy, RISE, um, are all involved in this effort. And we're, we're taking this sort of collaborative approach and collectively coming up with ideas and thoughts and, and comments. And a lot of those organizations have signed on to the coalition comment letter. So it's really taking the um, on the ground experiences of a lot of these communities and, and capturing those in our in our public comments. And so we are regularly engaging with communities in Coney Island and the Rockaways, but also all across all five boroughs of New York City um, and in the coastal parts of New Jersey. Thank you. Yeah, great. And then um, Marjorie is asking, um, does the Waterfront Alliance have contact with the city council to promote switching to permeable surfaces combined? <clears throat> It's a good question. Uh, so we have good, we have regular communication with the city council. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, testifying at city council hearings, meeting with city council members to talk about different legislative priorities. And again, I think this kind of falls into that last piece that I was talking about, about um, there's all these other opportunities and approaches that exist at the local level to push projects forward that maybe aren't involved with HATS. But as it relates to the Army Corps, we have been engaging with city council members and making them aware of sort of where our approach is and how we're thinking about this project. Um, I think in John's slide, you saw that there, there are a lot of different partners in this process. So it's the Army Corps, but it's also the city of New York. It's the state of New York. It's the state of New Jersey. So getting support from some of these um, agencies and council members and elected officials goes a really long way. And, uh, and yeah, sharing these different ideas about permeable pavement and different solutions, I think is really important, especially because permeable pavement is a great solution for some of the inland flooding risks that we're facing that are not captured in this uh, in, in HATS. HATS is really more of a coastal protection uh, and coastal risk reduction project, but there's a lot of flooding that we're obviously experiencing in inland communities that, that this project will not cover. And so working with the city council, working with the Department of Environmental Protection and different agencies to sort of look at different solutions there. And I would uh, recommend, let me see who asked that question. Um, Marjorie, to take a look at the uh, New York City DEP's uh, Cloudburst Management Program. So they're really pushing forward these creative and innovative ideas to address some of this inland flooding and extreme rain. And I think permeable pavement is one of the sort of uh, approaches that they're looking at through that through that program. So I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that, but. Well, that's right. There's a lot more to say about green infrastructure priorities and, and this current administration in New York City, as well as the city council. So we can but I'll let me before I talk more, let me open it up to more questions. So, yeah, Tom, you have a, your hand raised. Yes, uh, congratulations. You're doing great work. Um, we walk in your draft. Um, the mayor and the governor, you talk about the city council, about Congress people, about senators. How about the two principals who are going to come up with what John says is 18 billion bucks? Where, where do they stand on this? Have we gotten their attention? And uh, what can we do to increase their sense of urgency? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a long game. Decisions that are made now, as John showed, we got what, six to 13 months until they recommend something. Well, before they recommend something, uh, your, your example of asking for alternatives is great, but the two principles are really important. And I don't know if you have any read on what they're, uh, position is on this particular issue. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really great point. Um, and so we have absolutely been engaging with the, the mayor's administration uh, and the governor through mostly through the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, who is the lead uh, primary sponsor for the state of New York on this. So I'll just say two things really quickly. A few uh, organizations in the coalition, we've been meeting regularly with the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice. Uh, just to share sort of our thoughts and 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 hear what their thoughts are on the project. I will say we don't have a great sense of how they're uh, approaching their public comments, but we know that the mayor's of Office of Climate and Environmental Justice is putting forward a public comment to the core. So we'll all see that once the public comments are made available. Um, and I do also know that they're taking 
recommendations from the different city agencies, so parks, DEP, city planning, um, and, and feeding that into their own public comments. Um, but we've also We've also had a, a meeting with the commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and the uh, chief climate officer for New York City, where we sort of brought them all together with a few of our partners and shared some of these goals that we talked about today, and really asked them to take a bigger uh, step and, and more leadership on this project. And so that starts with simple things like community engagement, right? I mean, we saw the core doing all these community engagement sessions, but very little partnership with the city and the state on those sessions. So just really asking the city and the state to, to step up and, and support some of that effort. But also we're working on trying to get our recommendations in writing from some of these non-federal sponsors. Because to your point, Tom and, and John, uh, there is an agency decision milestone where the these non-federal sponsors do have to approve of what if whatever is, uh, is uh, put forward by the core. And so we want to make sure that our recommendations and our asks are heard by these non-federal sponsors. And if to the extent that they might be able to put them forward and support them, I think could really go uh, could go a long way. So still working on a lot of this stuff. And to your point, it's a long process, but we are engaging with all these different folks. And so, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. But thank you, Courtney. Feel free to add anything if I might have missed something. Well, let me add something. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, Tom, it's great to see you. Thanks for your continued interest. Good to see you. And uh, you haven't aged a day. Um, <laughs> still great. You can uh, lie with a straight face, John. <laughs> <laughs> the um, it's important to note that you know what Tyler said is you know let's not forget about the state of New Jersey because of the way this works is um, you got to get all of them. Um, really, the, the New York State does not need New York City uh, to agree to this unless they want New York City to pay for some of it which of course they will. Um, so, uh, you know, then, then, then what happens is you have agreements that are, have to be forged between the city and the state. And then th that agreement rolls into the agreement between the state of New York and the core uh, and, and has to be coupled with the agreement between the state of New Jersey and the core. And, and when the agencies sign up to this, they sign up to fund this um, at the required uh, level level and um, so these are major fiscal uh, decisions that are going to have to be made down the road right David I, David girl I see you have your hand up yeah and, and John I'm glad you mentioned the state of New Jersey because I don't, nobody else did yet um, so speaking from the state of New Jersey who who are you working with in the state government? What, what agencies are you working with in the uh, New Jersey state government or New Jersey municipalities? I can answer. Uh, so we in that commissioner's meeting that I mentioned earlier, we did we did engage with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. So Commissioner Latourette was at that meeting um, and Nick Engrone, the chief resiliency officer for New Jersey, was also in that meeting. And they actually took a a really uh, a strong approach and sounded like they were very supportive of what we've been of what we've been asking for here. Um, and I would say, you know, they probably were the most enthusiastic of all the of all the different uh, agencies that were represented in that in that meeting. So it was great to see. Uh, but in terms of local municipalities, we haven't really engaged with very many. Um, but we are working with a lot of the different organizations across New Jersey. Uh, so the Baykeeper, um, the Hackensack Riverkeeper, and um, New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. There's a few partners over there that we have been working with, Future City, Inc. Um, I'm forgetting a few, but but we have been engaging regularly through the coalition, again, with a lot of our partners in New Jersey, New Jersey Future. Um, and so there are a lot of partners that we're working with. But in terms of the government, I think we've just been sort of in the phases of, of meeting and getting a read of where they're at and sharing where we're at. But it's an again, it's an ongoing piece. So there will be more engagement with the different agencies across New Jersey and, and likely with some of the cities and municipalities there that are affected by this project. Uh, but as of now, I think our focus has been really working with some of the community groups there to understand what are the risks, putting that into our into our letter and then using these next few uh, months and years to really engage and beef up that uh, um, engagement with the municipalities and government. All right, great. Paula, I see you have your hand up. <laughs> just let me just jump in here for one oh, second. The, um, if you have to deal with all the municipalities, and there are dozens and dozens of them on the New Jersey side, it's going to make you absolutely crazy. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's nuts. So 
I, th I think you're taking the right approach and going with to the state departments, uh, working with this, the state executive branch. You know, that's the, I think that's the only way you're going to get anything done on this side of the river. Yeah, absolutely. We know that's a it's a challenge for sure, but uh, <laughs> right. but one that we're willing to face. <laughs> absolutely. All right, Paula. <laughs> hi, hi. Um, so I'm a, I'm a real novice on um, all of these approaches and so on. Um, but as a property owner on the waterfront in Long Island City, looking at those walls was um, really a little shocking for me um, because that certainly um, does not seem like a great approach for how people can interact with the water and so on. And really, uh, you know, it, it would completely change the dynamics of our area for sure. Um, so what I was wondering was, is it that the costs are prohibitive or um, that, you know, why is the in-water approach sort of, in some ways, I, I would look at that as almost more equitable because you must just be doing this at certain specific areas and cutting things off and stopping the water as opposed to then putting these walls in various places along um, the coastal areas. Yeah, John, go ahead and take that. <clears throat> Yeah, let me let me take that. It's a, it's a great question, Paula. And um, first of all, don't I mean the renderings are what they are, but um, the, I'll tell you what they're not, and that's uh, the final form of the project. A uh, long way to go. Um, and by the way, you should take your opportunity to influence, um, and, and we'll be right there with you. But essentially, um, the core is bound to recommend a project that gives what's called the uh, best national economic development um, benefit cost ratio uh, and um, with that with with an acceptable environmental impact um, so when they weigh these projects these 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 alternatives against each other they're looking for a benefit co rate, cost ratio, obviously over one, uh, but the higher you get, the, the better off you are because the core's mission is, is, is development, believe it or not. Um, you know, we want to develop our water resources, but we want to do that in a, in a responsible manner or, or we want to protect them or, or reduce the risks. Uh, you know, this is looking at water from the sense of bad water, if you will, water that we want to keep out of, of, of spaces. So the, the tentatively selected plan has a benefit cost ratio of 2.5. So essentially that means that for a $52 billion fixed cost, you're getting $150 billion. Well, you're getting $125 billion plus of benefits. Essentially those benefits come from um, reduced damages to flooding that would have occurred if, in fact, you did not build the project. Um, so it's 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 generally economics based, and I think one of the things that the Waterfront Alliance is advocating for is it's kind of maybe opening up that formula a little bit, where we can also consider um, benefits. Uh, you know, like the one you mentioned. There's a lot of social value to um, uh, accessibility uh, uh, to the waterfront. I mean, you know, sure, building a wall might be uh, less expensive, but it's sure socially, uh, uh, you know, it's prohibitive to some of the activities that we all like to enjoy. So how about we, we look at these projects in a way where we can uh, be more inclusive to the social benefits and the environmental, you know, going to natural and nature-based features. What about um, the fact that we might have the opportunity to actually enhance the environment, actually restore the environment to what where it was, you know, 150 years ago? You know, shouldn't we shouldn't we value that in some way that's beyond pure economics? And how do you do that? Um, so the, the core is has guidelines they must use, which tend to be focused on pure economics, um, but. It's important to know that it doesn't have to be that way. And we'd like to influence how they how they score their projects going forward. Thanks. All right. So 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Paula. That was a great question. So we have uh, time for just a few more questions. So Emlyn, you're for uh, you're next, and then Rick Larrabee, you'll go after that. Thank you, Courtney. I'd like to just uh, make a comment about the possibility of engaging the broader public in these visions, plans, options. Um, specifically, um, the fact that natural history museums, science centers, to some extent, art museums and local history museums are all they all have a vested interest in um, educating their publics of all ages and stages of learning about what's going on. I think it's a missed opportunity to, uh, to not uh, ask museums to become partners for uh, ranging from lobby displays. Um, we did this, as you'll recall, Courtney at Liberty Science Center. I, I can't speak to what they're doing now or not doing now, but uh, you know the, some of the grand visions of how to protect the the overall environment were, were, were studies that were, I think, presented at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. So I think none of these places should be ignored in the, obviously, the essential uh, desire to, um, to try and bring in the broader public um, because people are predisposed to learn and to know and to be interested. And so uh, I think that's a missed opportunity. It, it's not being pursued and I'm happy to help or advise on that front, still involved as I am in the museum field. Well, thank you, Ellen. I will take you up on that offer. Just echoing what Tyler had said before, this there really is a strength in numbers case be made for the number of people who are weighing in with the core directly on what they want and what they don't want. And so um, our capacity to engage at that level is something we're always talking about. We have a a major campaign for fundraising to increase our capacity to engage more people and more institutions. So great, thank you so much. All right, Rick, I pass it on to you. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, John and Tyler, great job. Um, I'm curious, uh, the involvement of the maritime industry, I mean, we've made huge investments. The Corps certainly has, yeah. the federal government has, but the local uh, municipalities have certainly invested in those and have uh, a tremendous amount of economic interest are they involved, Tyler, in, in any meaningful way? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so so we've engaged with the Port Authority um, and a couple of the different uh, stakeholders along the uh, in the Maritime Association to, to help you know influence our comments and address some of the questions that they have on this. I think just generally they're they seem pretty supportive of the project, uh, but there are questions in terms of if there's going to be a barrier, right? How does that affect navigation? What does it mean for uh, the, the the channels? And if there's a harbor deepening, what are the implications? And especially the construction and uh, of of a barrier, like for example, the one in the Arthur Kill. You know, what does that look like, and how does that affect navigability um, into the, in and out of the port? What are the procedures for if a storm is to be called? You know, what are the procedures for evacuating? Uh, uh, vessels and so there's a, there's a few questions that I think are still left a little bit unanswered where I know the Port Authority and some of the different maritime associations are going to weigh in on and and ask questions for um, but I think that the they are monitoring this closely especially because some of the barriers and some of the proposals are touching directly along their uh, port facilities um, but to the extent that the Port Authority is working with the city or with the, with the core I think they're probably in regular communication but with the city I'm not so sure uh, but our, our what the Waterfront Alliance comments do capture a little bit of that perspective from the from the Maritime Association, and um, obviously, you know, these public these comments will be public, and so we're happy to share them and 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 give you a sense of sort of how they're approaching it. And Rick, I'd also just add that we still have a few days before the comments are due, so any uh, ideas or thoughts that you might have about what should be captured in these comments, you know, we're obviously open and would welcome those thoughts. Thanks, so. But I'll turn it over. I mean, John, I don't know if you have anything maybe to add or Courtney, in terms of maritime and the connection to hats. Uh, I, I have something to say uh, to Rick. I just, you know, want to thank Rick for his partnership with the Harbor Deepening uh, Project. Uh, you know, I mean, no one uh, is more responsible for the success of that job than uh, Rick Larrabee when he's running the Port Commerce uh, Division in the Port Authority. And uh, thanks for his service in the Coast Guard for so many years and uh, appreciate his interest and his participation as one of our leaders in the Waterfront Alliance. Thanks, Rick. I'm here to defend myself, John. <laughs> I apologize for the sirens, uh, but I, I have I have a question for John. John, could you describe some of the potential scenarios for funding in terms of when funding may occur once appropriations happen and, and what we, we can look forward to or not look forward to? 
Sure. Um, I would just remind everyone to pay their taxes. Um, uh, but, um, you know, let, let me give you a couple scenarios. Um, you know, the core, the core there, there's a big project. If you're in the New Jersey area, it's in the Raritan River Basin. It's a it's a riverine flood risk project. It's called the Greenbrook Project. And this thing was um, authorized um, decades ago, I think in the late 1990s. And uh, th this this thing was about a half a billion dollar project, a smaller project, but it's the bit it's one of the biggest flood risk reduction projects in, on, um, east of the Mississippi, believe it or not. And um, it's in in New Jersey, and um, some of us are a little older may remember in Boundbrook. They call it Boundbrook for a reason. It's bound, you know, this this village is bound by water on all sides, and. Essentially, there was a big storm and um, people drowned um, as a result of it. That's what bore this uh, project, gave birth to this project. But the Corps has been getting funding since that's authorized in increments every year, 10 million, 20 million. They built a few hundred million dollars of that project. Um, they've, they've raised bridges, they built levees, core levees, they built pump stations, they've uh, uh, installed gates that need to be. Um, um, brought across some um, roads during flooding, et cetera. So that, that's kind of right in this region. Um, and those of you living in that area know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, um, so you can get uh, a funding in increments, yearly increments um, through the appropriations process, or you can have an example of the New Orleans, you know, Katrina, where the Corps was actually appropriated all the money and it ended up being $14 billion worth of money so they could build a hurricane risk reduction system down there. And, and that project was built in a much more efficient manner. Um, so it's gonna be up to Congress to figure out um, how to appropriate 52 billions a lot. Um, you know, again, some of that's coming from New York and New Jersey and they would have to actually figure out how to fund it upfront also. Uh, more likely, but, um, you know, I, I think there's different ways that it could be done based on the political will and the challenge uh, that, the, that the country's facing, the priorities uh, that, that, that the Congress is dealing with at the particular time. All right, so that concludes our webinar. I want to thank all the people on this call and on this webinar who have supported this work. Uh, I hope you can see some of the results of that investment that you've made in what, what is one of the most critical questions we're gonna be facing as a region. And again, just a teaser, you will be hearing from us about the 15 to 20 year strategy that we're going to be engaging in and look forward to seeing you at that next conversation, most likely in the fall. And my huge thanks to John, uh, John for today and for your service and Rick as well. And uh, I believe we have a few other Waterfront Alliance board members on this call today. So thank you all for joining and thanks to Tyler and the team for putting this together. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.